Chautauqua is made possible by the Maryland Humanities Council, Montgomery College, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello and welcome to our program called Chautauqua. Chautauqua is a living history program where scholar actors portray famous people in history who've made a significant impact on the world. I'm Angela Rice Beamer here at the Germantown campus of Montgomery College and our theme is Turning Points in History. Tonight's Chautauqua character lived from 1919 to 1972 and his impact was social, economic, and political. Tonight's Chautauqua character is the legendary baseball great Jackie Robinson. Thank you so very much. Good evening. I hope everybody's enjoying this Friday night. Thank you for coming, because I truly want to share my story with you. But before I start my story, there's always one very important person that I need to thank. Thanks, Mr. Ricky! My friend. Mr. Branch, Ricky, and me. Miss, we play catch every single day. But ever since April 15th, 1997, sir, he's been throwing that ball past me. By the time I chase it down, miss, I find myself in another place, in front of a great group of people. You see, sir, he wants me to tell you fans how over 65 years ago I was able to cross that line into Major League Baseball. I'm Jackie Robinson and I love being a baseball angel. Traveling from place to place, telling my story of how over 65 years ago, sir, I was able to cross that line into Major League Baseball. But miss, it's very important for me to start from the beginning of my life to show you that the insult, my friends, the suffering I put up with that first year with the Brooklyn Dodgers, or to show you that wasn't the first time those things had happened to me. I was born January 31st, 1919, in a place called Cairo, Georgia. But in Cairo, Georgia, there was this thing called segregation. There was a separation between colored people and whites. My mother, Mally Robinson, she wanted us to get a good education. So she moved us to Pasadena, California when I was just one year old because my young friend in California, truly there wasn't much segregation. However, it turned out in Pasadena, we were the only colored family in an all-white neighborhood. Miss, the neighbors didn't like us very much. Oh, no. They called us names, made fun of us, even offered my mother Mally money to move us out of that neighborhood. But my mother Mally Robinson, she would have none of that. No, she would tell us time and time again, sir, it's important to stand alone and you kids be strong. And my friends, that message would stay with me all of my life. Miss, helping me to get through a lot of hard times in my life. Miss, it helped me to get through growing up in Pasadena, California. Because you see, my young friends, the kids in the neighborhood, they didn't like me very much either because of the color of my skin. They made fun of me. They called me names. Most important to me, miss, they wouldn't let me play on that neighborhood team. Oh, that is until, of course, they found that I was fast, miss. They found that I was a pretty good athlete. And miss, that's when they begged me to be on the team. 
And that's when I learned that sometimes when people won't accept you for the way you look, sometimes they will accept you for your ability to compete. And that neighborhood team, we were a good team. We never lost. However, folks, there's one other thing I need to tell you about our neighborhood team. Something I'm not very proud of, miss. You see, our neighborhood team, we were a gang. Yes, miss. A gang. And we called ourselves the Pepper Street Gang. And like most gangs, sir, we got into an awful lot of trouble. We broke into places. We stole from people. We made fun of people. And we made quite a few trips to the police station. Well, I'll never forget it. One day at school, Mr. Stevens, he pulled me to the side. He said, Jackie, why do you run with this gang? Why do you hang with this crowd? You're a good athlete, Jackie. You've got that gift. So why don't you take your gift? Jackie, let that take you further. You know, Jackie, sometimes it's important to stand alone, son, but you've got to be strong. It was the same thing my mother, Mally Robinson, had said to me, miss. And now Mr. Stevens, he was telling him the same thing. So I took Mr. Stevens' advice. Sir, I left the gang, and that gift, miss, it did take me further. You see, sir, I was a star athlete in high school. It led me to Pasadena Junior College, where I was the quarterback on the football team. Sir, when having a colored quarterback was unheard of. Basketball, miss. I led the conference in scoring. In track, I broke my brother Max's long jump record, and not too many people know this. Folks, in 1936, my brother Mac was an Olympian. Yes, he finished second to the great Jesse Owens in a 200-yard dash at the Berlin Olympics. Oh, yes, and that same day that I broke my brother Max's long jump record of 25 feet, six and a half inches. Sir, I went on that day to play in a baseball game. There was a scout watching from the Chicago White Sox, and hey, sir, I made a couple spectacular plays, and that scout, he made it a point to say to my manager at the end of that game, why, if that boy were white, he could play for any team in the major leagues. Well, sir, I was a colored man. And my friends, colored men, we weren't allowed to play in Major League Baseball in 1938. But my young friend, the gift, it would take me further. I accepted a scholarship at the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA, miss. Miss, it was at UCLA where I became the first athlete ever to letter in four sports. Football, baseball, basketball, track. I was an okay swimmer. Folks, I was an outstanding golfer. My young friend, it was at UCLA where I'd meet my future wife, Rachel Isom. Miss, it was at UCLA. Unfortunately, miss, hard times would once again fall on our Robinson family. I felt it was important to leave school, get a job, help my family make the ends meet. My young friend, my mother, Mally, protested, telling me that an education is the best gift you can ever be given. Naturally, she was right. But I left school. Yes. I took a job with the National Youth Administration as a counselor. So that was like being a coach to me. That was something I always wanted to do, sir. And wouldn't you know it, right after I took that job, the United States enters World War II. So now I have to go into the Army. And I felt if I could become that officer in the Army, now I can make enough money to help my family and also marry Rachel. But you see, folks, the Army, they weren't very kind to a colored man trying to become an officer. Actually, sir, they made it pretty difficult. So I happened to make friends with this man by the name of Joe Lewis. And at that time, Joe Lewis, he was boxing's heavyweight champion of the world. And Joe, 
Oh, this was a colored man with a lot of influence in the Army. Helped me to get into officer's candidate school. I graduated from that school as second lieutenant and still. Sir, that discrimination, sir, had a way of finding me. I was riding the bus with my best friend's wife, miss. A colored woman. Yes, miss, her skin color was very light. The bus driver thought she was white. Miss, he ordered me to the back of the bus. I refused. When we returned to the base, sir, I was arrested. I was charged with conduct on becoming an officer. I was charged with public drunkenness. Now, I knew this public drunkenness had to be a made-up charge. You see, my young friend, all my life, my young friend, I had taken pride in the fact, son, I never let alcohol, tobacco, or drugs ever affect my ability to compete in this life. I fought those charges. I was found innocent of them. Sir, I asked for and I did receive an honorable discharge from the Army. But it was while I was in the Army. That's when I heard about the Negro Leagues of Baseball. Kansas City Monarchs were holding tryouts for players. I tried out for, sir, I became the Monarch starting shortstop. Oh, and in those Negro Leagues, folks, we had a wealth of talent. Oh, sir, on our team alone, we had a pitcher by the name of Satchel Paige. <laughs> Satchel played in baseball for over 40 years. He pitched in over 2,500 games. Folks, he pitched his last game at the age of 61 years old in the major leagues with the Cleveland Indians. Roy Campanella, he joined with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1948, sir. Josh Gibson, power hitter. And he played in Pittsburgh for the Homestead Grays. You know, sir, it said if those records were kept correctly in the Negro League, sir, Josh, he would have hit more home runs than the great, the powerful, the legendary. Babe Ruth. And Larry Doby. My friends, I'm going to ask each and every one of you here tonight at Montgomery College to do me a favor. Please don't ever forget that name. Larry Doby. Because you see, folks, he's just as important to breaking the color barrier in Major League Baseball as me. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Eleven weeks after I broke the color barrier in the National League, miss, with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Eleven weeks later, miss, Larry Doby would break the color barrier in the American League with the Cleveland Indians. But I will tell you, my friends, that life in those Negro Leagues, miss, it was tough. Sometimes we'd ride on a bus for days at a time without a hot meal to eat, without a bed to sleep in. My friends, in most of the towns we played in, the restaurants did not serve colored people. The hotels, they were for whites only. One day, we were playing in Chicago, and I happened to meet this gentleman by the name of Clyde Sukfor, sir scout for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He told me that a Mr. Branch Rickey wanted to meet with me in his office in New York. Said he wanted to talk to me about joining a Negro League team he was forming. Folks, he called them the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers. <laughs> well, he said these Brown Dodgers would play in Ebbets Field whenever the Brooklyn Dodgers were out of town. Miss, he told me the money would be better than that in Negro Leagues. Sir, he told me the living accommodations would be better also. My friends, I felt I had nothing to lose. So I went to go see this Mr. Ricky. And it turns out he's a very big man. Big bushy eyebrows. Big horn rim glasses. Mr. Ricky always wore a nice crisp suit, sir. Huge big bow tie. And Mr. Ricky always had that big, fat, stogie cigar hanging out of his mouth. And I will tell you, Montgomery, Mr. Ricky was a kind man. 
Mr. Ricky. He was an honest man. Folks, he told me right from the beginning, there is no Negro League team. Miss, he told me right from the beginning, miss, he wanted me to become part of his great experiments. He said he wanted me to become the first Negro to play in Major League Baseball. But Mr. Ricky didn't stop there. You see, my friends, he told me how close to impossible his great experiment would be. He told me how the owners of the teams in the league, sir, they didn't think it was time yet for the colored man in Major League Baseball. He told me the players would protest because the players, miss, most of them were from the South, miss. They grew up in legal segregation. They did not want to play with the colored man. And the fans. Most important part, folks. You fans. Mr. Ricky told me that the fans might take offense of seeing a colored man on the field with whites. He said they might boo me, call me names, perhaps even threaten me and my family, sir. He talked how those players would come sliding in a second with their cleats first, trying to cut me, trying to hurt me. Miss, he talked how the pitchers were going to throw their pitches intentionally at me, miss, trying to hit me and trying to hurt me. But, sir, Mr. Ricky didn't stop there, sir. He told me if I wanted to be the first Negro to play in Major League Baseball, he told me I would have to learn to take the abuse. My young friend, I was not allowed to fight back. Mr. Ricky said in order for the great experiment to work, in order for other players to come up from the Negro Leagues, he told me I would have to learn to turn the other cheek to this abuse. Sir, that's when I looked Mr. Ricky right in his eyes, sir, and I said, Mr. Ricky, sir, sir, you're looking for a colored boy who's afraid to fight back. And he said, no, Jack. I am looking for a colored man, son, with guts enough not to fight back. Jack, sometimes it's important to stand alone, son. It's important to be strong, son. Help is always on the way. Now, after hearing that, it didn't take me long to accept Mr. Ricky's offer. An offer that paid me a $3,500 signing bonus. $600 a month salary, miss. Miss, it was enough at that time to take care of my family and to also marry Rachel. But you have to understand, miss, Mr. Ricky said I would report to the Montreal Royals of the International League of Baseball, folks, the minor leagues of baseball. Miss, he told me that in Canada, miss, miss, he said the fans in Canada might be a little more accepting of a colored man in Canada than in my own country, the United States. And yes, my young friend, we did have legal segregation. I hate to admit it, Mr. Ricky was right. But before I reported the spring training in Sanford, Florida with those Montreal Royals, miss, miss, there was one very important matter I needed to take care of. I married Rachel. Together, we reported the spring training in Sanford, Florida, miss, together. We faced the first roadblock that was thrown right in our face. You see, son, the city officials in Sanford decided they weren't going to watch a colored man playing on a field with whites in their town. They banned us from having spring training there, folks. We had to move spring training to Daytona Beach. Rachel and I stayed with a colored family. The rest of the team, they stayed in an all-white hotel. Oh, it was something we knew was going to happen. And from the very beginning, most of my teammates with the Royals. I'm one of them. Most of them. <laughs> oh, they did accept me. Some of them even helped me to learn the little differences between the Negro Leagues and organized baseball. And I will never, ever forget that first game of the season. We were playing in Jersey City, New Jersey, against the Jersey City Giants. 
Sir, my first at bat, sir, I came up to that plate so nervous, I was actually shaking in my shoes because I was waiting for the crowd to boo me. Miss, I was waiting for the crowd to make fun of me. Nothing happened, miss. It was so quiet in that ballpark, you could have heard a pin drop, which made me even more nervous. <laughs> so nervous. I swung at the first pitch, hit it right back to the shortstop. I was automatically thrown out at first. My next at bat, I came up to the plate feeling a little less nervous. Miss, I had to be. Two men on, miss. It was important for me to get on base. I got the sign from the third base coach to bunt, but that infield had moved so far in, that sign quickly changed to swing away. And wouldn't you know it, with the crack of that bat, the roar of that crowd, 340 feet later. <laughs> Sir, I hit my first home run in organized baseball. <laughs> Felt pretty nice. My next at bat, I came up to the plate feeling kind of confident now. Oh, yes, I laid down a sweet bunt right back to that shortstop. But this time, I hustled down a line. Beat it out the first. Now, now it was time to show my base running skills. As that pitcher started to wind up, oh, he made it so easy to steal second. <laughs> He started to wind up again. He made it even easier to steal third. You know what, doctor? It turned out to be a fantastic day in Jersey City, New Jersey. <laughs> I hit three out of four times at that plate. Knocked in three runs, stole two bases. My friends, we went on to beat the Jersey City Giants that day. 14 to 1. Unfortunately, things would get a little more difficult our next game. We had to travel to Baltimore, Maryland. And in Baltimore, the fans there let me know they weren't going to watch a colored man play their team in Baltimore. They booed me. They called me names. They made life so unbearable for me in Baltimore, folks. I had to leave the game midway through, and I will tell you, it did not get any easier the next game, my friends. Miss, that's when we traveled to a place called Syracuse, New York. And the fans did a lot of the same. Booing me, calling me names. But you see, in Syracuse, folks, they threw things at me. One fan. One fan actually threw a black cat at me on the field with a rope tied tight around its neck. My friends, that's when he announced that my cousin had arrived. But through it all, with the help of my teammates, as a team, sir, we made it through that International League season. Went on to play in the Little World Series, folks. A series that started out in Louisville, Kentucky, a town that was deeply rooted in legal segregation. And in Louisville, son, the fans there let me know there was no way they were going to watch a colored man play the fantastic white team in Louisville. Oh, folks, they booed me something fierce. And they called me names that you could never, ever imagine. They made life so miserable for me in Louisville. Sir, I went into a batting slump so deep, sir, I couldn't even hit the side of a barn with a bat. My friend, I could hardly wait to get home to Montreal. 
I miss when we did return to Montreal. Our fans. Our fans that heard about the way I'd been treated down in Louisville. And our fans. They gave it right back to that Louisville team. We went on to win the Little World Series. And at the end of that final game, the only colored man on the field, Miss, was being carried off the field. by an all-white crowd. Felt pretty nice there. At the end of that season, I would be named the International League Player of the Year, son. At the end of that season, son, now I have to cross the line into Major League Baseball. And crossing that line, miss, it was a nightmare. But it was a very big learning experience, folks. You see, my friends, I learned in 1947, people do have the ability to change the way they feel about other people. Oh, yes, in the beginning of that season, it was tough. When I first reported to spring training in Havana, Cuba, not too many of my teammates would even bother to... shake my hand. Except for one. One teammate who did step up to the plate, sir. And I'm hoping everybody here tonight heard of him. Because his name is Pete Wee Reese. And Pee Wee. He was a different type of man. You see, miss, he told me right from the beginning, he was from Louisville, Kentucky, man. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The same town that had abused me. That same town that had made fun of me in that little World Series. But as I said, this was a different type of man. You see, my friends, he told me he did something I thought not too many people, then or now, colored or white, would take the time to do. Pee Wee, he said he put himself in my shoes. He said he imagined himself, miss, as the only white player on an all-colored team. He said he imagined himself being abused by the fans, having things thrown at him, being called names, being made fun of. And my, he told me in his imagination... It did not feel very good, sir. He told me he'd be there for me if I needed him. And he was. As for the rest of my teammates, I'd have to win them over one by one, miss. In the beginning of that season, there was a petition out. If I entered that field on April 15th, 1947, most of the players in the league, sir, they were going on strike. President of the league, Happy Chandler, he caught wind of that plan. Folks, he calls all the general managers into a meeting and he told them, any player that strikes on April 15, 1947 will be banned from Major League Baseball for life. Mr. Ricky. Sir, Mr. Ricky called a couple of my teammates into his office, and all he said was, any of you men that don't want to play with Jack Robinson, leave now. And still, that season started out very rough. Just like Mr. Ricky said, the fans, they did boo me. They did call me names. Folks, they threatened me, sir. Sir, they threatened my family. Miss, one fan actually wrote us a letter, miss, that he was going to kidnap my newborn son, Jackie Jr., if I entered that field on April 15, 1947, and that was just like Mr. Ricky said. The players, they did taunt me. They did call me names. And yes, miss, some of the players did come sliding in a second with their cleats first, miss, trying to cut me trying to hurt me. Some of them, some of them, they would kick dirt in my face. And others, folks, others simply would spit in my face. The pitchers, they threw those 90 mile an hour fastballs intentionally at me, trying to hit me. Yes, they did want to hurt me. 
Because you see, my friends, my first at bat in the major leagues, the first four pitches thrown to me were thrown at me. I led the league in 1947 in that category of a player being hit by pitches. We played the Philadelphia Phillies. Now, they were led by Ben Chapman. And Ben Chapman was from Mississippi. And Ben Chapman, let it be known, he did not care for this colored man. So he led his team in abusing me. Hey, colored boy, get over here, boy. You start cleaning out this dugout, boy, right now, boy. Hey, colored boy. Hey, boy, get over here now and start shining up all our shoes, boy. When I went to go bat at the plate, the catcher, he went to sweep the plate with his little broom, and I, the catcher said to the ump, hey, ump, why, why don't you let that colored boy do it? Why don't you let this here Robinson boy do it? It's his job. I had to be strong. My young friend, I definitely was standing all alone. And you know, my young friend, I kept hearing my mother, Mally Robinson's voice in this here saying, it's important to stand alone, Jackie. Be strong. Son, I kept hearing Mr. Ricky's voice in this here saying, turn the other cheek, Jackie. Turn the other cheek. Help us on the way. My young friend, that was the only way I made it through that day. And wouldn't you know it, the next day, sir, the very next day, those Phillies, they start again with their taunting, again with their name calling. Only on this day, I could feel the anger building up inside of me. I knew on this day, I would break the promise to Mr. Ricky, ruin the great experiment. I was going to ruin that chance for those other great players to come up from those Negro leagues. And right when I was ready to blow my stack, right when I was ready to lose my cool, I saw a white flask go running by. It was my teammate, Ed Stanky. Stank. He goes running into the Philly dugout, and he's screaming at all the Philly players, you yellow-bellied cowards. Come on. Come on. Why don't you all pick on someone who's allowed to fight back? Miss, that was the first time one of my teammates had come to my aid, miss. It was that Stanky. And he's going to take on a whole Philadelphia team for me. It seemed like almost immediately, the Phillies stopped their taunting. They stopped the name calling. And we went on the rest of that game, my friends. And now, we played awfully hard. As a as a team, sir. We had to play the Phillies one last game in that three-game series. Only on this day, sir, there was no taunting from the Phillies. Sir, no name calling. My friend, the Phillies played hard ball. They played aggressive ball. Folks, they hustled around all the base pads the way this game should be played. They had a player by the name of Richie Ashburn. Oh, my goodness. Richie, he was a hustler. Richie, he was an aggressive player. That Richie, he came sliding in a second with his cleats first. And when he hit it, he kicked up all the dirt in the area. And when that dust settled, miss, I lay on that ground. Miss, I am holding my badly bleeding leg. And as Richie Ashburn stood over top of me, I waited for him to call me some bad name, and I, I waited for him to make this racial comment. Richie Ashburn apologized. He said he was sorry. Folks, I believe the most important thing anybody's ever said to me before in my life. Richie told me, when he saw the red blood running out of my leg, folks, that's what let him know. There's no difference between us. And miss, as Richie helped me up to my feet, all the pain, miss, it was replaced with joy. I watched people change. 
I watched some of my teammates change. I watched some of those Philadelphia Phillies change. And we go on the rest of that season, folks. Yes, we are now playing awfully hard as a, as a team, sir. We won the National League pennant in 1947. Went on to play in the World Series against our crosstown rivals, those legendary New York Yankees. Well, we lost the series to the Yankees in 47. But at the end of that season, missed something else very important happened. At the end of that season, I would be named baseball's first ever, colored or white. Rookie of the Year in Major League Baseball by the Sporting News. A paper in the beginning of that season, they put in bold print right on their front page, Jackie Robinson has no business playing in Major League Baseball. And now, now, they named me baseball's first ever, colored or white. Rookie of the Year. But the most important thing, they too had changed. In 1948, just like Mr. Ricky promised, more players did come up from the Negro Leagues. Roy Campanella, he joins with the Brooklyn Dodgers and Campy would become the greatest Dodger catcher ever, bar none. Larry Doby, in 1948, Larry Doby would help to lead his Cleveland Indian team to a World Series championship. 1949, my best season in the majors. I led the league in stolen bases, runs batted in, double plays turned. And midseason, sir, I would cross that line, sir, as I was named the first African American ever to play in that All Star Classic. And at the end of that season, my friends, I will cross that line one more time when I was named baseball's most valuable player. Thank you. My friends, in the 10 seasons I played in Major League Baseball, seven of those 10 seasons, African Americans finishes either player of the year Rookie of the Year, seven of those ten seasons. What a great accomplishment. In 1956, after ten seasons of Major League Baseball, oh yes, ten seasons of some pain and miss, ten seasons of some joy. It was time for me to move on, sir. My young friend, I realized there were other lines in society, my young friend, that needed to be crossed by and for African Americans. But before I announced my retirement from Major League Baseball, it was announced I'd been traded to the New York Giants. Oh yes, the Giants had a young player they were trying to develop now. And they had this young player, you know sir, they wanted me to help bring him along. No, maybe you heard of him. His name was Willie Mays. I figured to say, hey, kid, wouldn't need my help. So I retired in 1956. You know, sir, I took a position with a restaurant chain. I hope you heard of it. It's called Chock Full of Nuts. And with Chock Full of Nuts, my friends, I became the Vice President of Community Relations, and it made me the first ever African-American Vice President of a major corporation. In 1962, I was honored, and I was named as the first African-American ever inducted into baseball's prestigious club, the National Baseball Hall of Fame.
thank you. You know, folks, it was important for three people, Miss, who had made a huge impact on my life to be there. Of course, my mother, Mally Robinson, who all my life, Mom told me how important it is to stand alone. My young friend, Mom told me how important it is be strong. Rachel Robinson, my wife, who suffered through those 10 long seasons with me, and sometimes, miss, it was Rachel. She actually carried me on her back, my young friend, through the hard times. And of course, of course, Mr. Branch Rickey. Mr. Branch Rickey. Sir, a man who was my best friend in all the world. Sir, a man who was like the father that I never, ever had. And miss, a man who was out, miss. Truly, I wouldn't be here tonight at this beautiful Montgomery College sharing my story with you. But you know, my friends, before I leave here tonight, before I leave here tonight, I got to tell you the most important thing that I say and end with with every single night. Please always remember, folks, a life is not important. No. No. Miss, it's simply not important. Miss, except for the impact. it has in other lives. Every single one of these young people in this room with me today, with us tonight, every single one of these young people, my young friends, please remember, you have a special gift inside of you. Please, guys, find your and you develop it to its fullest. And please always remember, my young friends, that sometimes when you're trying to find your gift, please remember, my young friends, that sometimes when you're trying to develop your gift, you too might be standing alone. Please, be strong, miss. I guarantee you the help. It's always right behind you. And just like me, I guarantee you that help. It is always on the way. My friends, tonight here at this beautiful Montgomery College, I want to thank you so much for coming out and listening to my story. But the most important thing, and I, I have to say it, from this day forward, please, make this day Folks, please, make every day a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. here with Gregory Gibson Kenny who has just performed as Jackie Robinson thanks so much for being here again you were here four years ago it, the, the time seems such a short time it did <laughs> it, it, it seems like a short while ago I mean four years eh, it really isn't that long Angela but I'm happy to be back I, I'm, I'm really 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 happy that they invited me back we're, we're glad to have you you're performance seems a little different. Are there new things that you've added to your performance since last time? No, no, there, there's nothing, no, nothing new added. I, I think um, having become, I think every year I find something new and, 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 and be, uh, definitely become more familiar and a lot easier as being Jackie Robinson. And, and I, I, I uh, become a little more relaxed every year. Uh, I, I think age has something to do with it. I think I started doing Jackie Robinson when I was... Uh, I believe I was 39 at the time, you know, and now I'm 55. So uh, each year, 
you know, as I get a little older and get a little closer, you know, to Jackie, uh, it becomes a little easier for me uh, to, to deliver, to understand even a little more of what was happening at that time and understanding the words, even though I wrote them, understanding the words a little better. You know, I always find something new. I always find something new that I touch on and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be driving and I'll be like, wow, you know, this, 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 this is the way this should have been. And so over years, you, you become a little more relaxed. Uh, you fall into the role a little bit more. And, and, and then, you know, obviously a little more comfortable. Every year you get more comfortable. There seem to be more, uh, there's an, uh, an emotional uh, tenor to what you were describing that seemed to come through. Yes. Yes, and I think that that has to do with the experience, you know, of, of, of just doing the program over and over and over and over again and, and just relaxing yourself with the program and letting the emotions just take, take their place. Let, let the emotions ride the way they're going to ride and feeling the character, feeling Jackie Robinson. I think that's another thing. As you get older as an actor, you know, you start to feel things a lot more. You get, you get a feeling for things a lot more. And I know when I was studying acting, all my, all my uh, you know, teachers, my professors would tell me, relax, as you get older, you start to feel it more. You start to become real comfortable. You start to settle. And that's, when you get there, you'll know it. And I'm starting to know it. That's, that's, that's the neat thing about acting, yes. Jackie Robinson was a man of incredible discipline. Uh, where did that discipline come from? Discipline in the way he sort of lived his life in a way. Uh, well, I think the discipline had to come from his mother, who was very strict, you know, and 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 brought all those kids up on her own. Uh, I I think a lot of it had to do with his mother, the discipline, um, of course, you know, being in the military, um, and just the discipline of growing up the way he did, you know, in, in a in a white society basically, where uh, he was dealt a lot of blows, where he was, you know. Like breaking the color barrier. He was always breaking the color barrier. Jackie was always breaking the color barrier, you know, playing football at UCLA, playing at Pasadena Junior College. You know, not too many people know, when he played at Pasadena Junior College, he was the quarterback. When he got to UCLA, he became the halfback because he was colored black. He wasn't allowed to play quarterback. So those, those, well, those walls were always being thrown in his face. So there's a discipline there of how to act, you know, how to do the things that you're, you're supposed to do and keep yourself in line at the same time. Yes. How, did, how did Mr. Ricky, uh, how did he know all these things about Robinson to choose him above other? Well, had, he, had he researched him? Exactly, he, uh, mm -hmm. exactly. He researched him. He studied him. He had Sukforth go out and follow him. He had other people watching Jackie Robinson. Uh, and, and I think, but the most important thing, he watched the way he grew up and the environment that he grew up in. And, and as I said earlier, being part of the white society. He'd already been there. He'd already done that. If you're going to go get you know, a person from uh, one of the players that grew up down south who had never mingled with white folks before, you know, had never gone to school with white folks before, that's total segregation there. Jackie's actually living with those folks. He's living with these people. And, 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 and he's enduring the racism with these people as well. He was the perfect choice. And, and I think over time we see that he was the perfect choice. Tell me a little bit more about Rachel, his wife, mm -hmm. and um, uh, their relationship and her strength. Well, I think she was the strongest part of it too. Uh, Rachel was the one that always told Jackie that, uh, you know, w we have to do this. You know, a lot of people, we give, you know, and we should give Jackie Robinson, you know, all this credit. But I don't think Rachel gets enough credit because there were so many times when he said, I quit. And she said, we can't. And it was always, we can't. And she traveled with him. And she sat in the stands and endured the racism and, and the name calling and, and people throwing things on her as well as they did her husband. You know, it was, it was a thing they did together. And I wish, even maybe in my program, I, maybe I needed to recognize her a little bit more. But just maybe there's not enough time you know, to tell Jackie's story. And, and, but maybe one day I would like to write a program about her and tell her side of the story because it truly needs to be told. Her strength and, and the way she brought, she carried him, she, the way she brought him through this hard time. You know, and people talk about a strong woman. Well, every man needs a strong woman. She definitely was his, without a doubt. Uh, and also, you, you mentioned Pee -wee, Pee Wee Reese and what he did at that time when he kind of stood by Jackie Robinson at a time that was mm -hmm. extremely difficult. Talk a little bit more about him. 
I think the thing that intrigued me the most about Pee Wee Reese, Angela, he was from Louisville, Kentucky. It was a very hateful place. He had been taught to hate. And he felt when he met Jackie Robinson, watching him go through these things, obviously somewhere in his life, he had dealt and had sympathy for somebody who was going through this racism and this segregation because he seemed to grab on to Jackie and tell him, it's not fair, I'm here for you. You know, I'll go through it with you and, and we'll make it happen. You know, and put, actually not too many people understand, by, you mentioned putting his arm around his shoulder. By doing that, he could have been threatened, he could have been hurt. I mean, bad. But he stood up for what he believed in and I'm still trying to think where that came from. It just had to be him as a man and saying, you know, we need to be, treat each other like human beings. So, so the supportive people in his life helped. You, you know, you, you mentioned in your presentation about the need to stand alone. Yes. And that's extremely important for all of us as individuals. That's right. But yes. the creating that that uh, supportive group is, is also extremely important. But that standing alone, I think, is an important message for young people today, for all of <laughs> See, us, really. Yes. No, no, but, 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 but I think you hit it right on the head there. You know, because it is about, uh, you know, for me, a lot of it is about young people, to be strong. We see the kids these days. You know, we look at Jackie Robinson, and we can look at Jackie Robinson a a a as being bullied. And today, in our schools, we see so many kids that are being bullied and pushed around and, and told that they're not good enough. You know, and we watch, if we can watch Jackie and we can take the color out of it, we can see the exact same things the bullying that's involved. So it is an important message for young people. Be strong. And when I, when I do that at the end and I, I look at that young person and I say, be strong. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, I know, you have, I, I know you're having a hard time sometime. I know you're having a hard time. We all did as kids. Be strong. Help is on the way, truly. And that is a message basically for them. Yes. Another thing you mentioned was finding your gift. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, as an actor, uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to find a gift, a God-given gift that's given to me. Um, I do. I, I feel really, really rich because of it, and uh, and because of the richness I've in my company and, and the success that I've had. I think it's very important to share that with them, to let them know that they may see the kid who's a great athlete, and they say, "Wow, he's so talented." He says, "Well, you too have a gift." But you got to find it. You got to find it, and you got to know what it is. And so I try to tell them. I'll sometimes, are you a good artist? Can you draw? And I'll, they'll show me something, and I'll say, "You're a fantastic artist. That's your gift. Gifts come in many different forms. It's not always sports. It's not always, you know. Maybe you're a great dancer. You know. Maybe maybe you're good at math. Everybody's got a gift. Everybody on this planet has a gift. But you've got to find your gift. And I think it's very important to point that out to them that you do have a gift. Find it, develop it, and, and know that you'll move in life very, very smoothly. And once you find that gift, I want to read a quote that you had. We only have about, uh, we have less than two minutes oh, left. That's too bad. I know. <laughs> so quickly. Life is not important except for the impact it has on other lives. Yes, yes. Is that a Robinson quote? That's a Jackie Robinson <laughs> quote. That is, and I love to end the program with Jackie Robinson, with that Jackie Robinson quote. Uh, he, he gave it one in his Hall of, uh, in his Hall of Fame speech, and uh, I like to, to put it out there every single day. A life is not important except for the impact it has in other lives. And if we can all grab hold of that, you know, as people, as individuals, as neighbors, boy, we can, we can move, we can move, we can move mountains. <laughs>